Atheist Nomads, episode 81. Carl Mamer is not dead. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low-price, full-featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A-R-C-H-W-A-Y hosting.com. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Howdy, hello, neighbor. And joining us this time is Carl Mamer. Carl, welcome to Atheist Nomads. Oh, thanks for having me. Lovely to have you. We actually just got done recording another interview, so we were talking to Britain, and now we're talking to Canada. Yeah, yeah, the Commonwealth. You're working through the Commonwealth. Yeah. Quite the, uh, the 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 international day. <laughs> yeah. Kind of sounded American to me. I don't know. <laughs> well, I always <laughs> joke, you know, of of all the sort of former British colonies, uh, you know, we're the only ones who didn't get really sexy accents. <laughs> <laughs> Like I, you know, I, li- I lived in Seattle for like four years and the Canadian accent just was not working for me there. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't work with the ladies. Uh, no, it, 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 it's, it was like, you sound like us, but just slightly more irritating. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, yeah, yeah. damn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a ferry boat ride from Seattle myself. So yeah, I totally understand. Yeah. yeah and I lived there <laughs> but, for three years. It's a fine, fine city. <laughs> oh, goodness. So, yeah, now you're over on the east coast of Canada, eh? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm in Tor- Toronto. Well, I, I've sort of moved out to the Burbs to be sort of my girlfriend and her four-year-old. And uh, so, uh, but yeah, so the, the greater Toronto area, you might call it. All right. Nice. Hmm. So, uh, consider yourself a skeptic, huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I do a I do a podcast called Con- Conspiracy Skeptic, and I, I probably that's where where uh, uh, Wesley kn- knows me from. Yep. And uh, uh, yeah, I, well, say doing as in you know I I used to do, and I, I intend to do another episode. But uh, uh, you know the the, uh, the girlfriend and the four year old and the job and all that sort of stuff have kind of like you know sucked a lot of time out of my my life and. And, uh, you know, it sort of makes it hard for, you know, recording and researching and, you know, getting people to interview and stuff like that. But I, people who are listening to this who know my podcast, I swear I'm coming out with a new one soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've always liked your take on that, that, you know, you just have them tell their story, what their, you know, their favorite conspiracy is. And yeah, yeah. kind of reminds hmm. me of Marsh and Be Reasonable, uh, yeah. where he okay. basically picks a topic and just discuss it. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, I used to do sort of what I call my solo shows where I'd sort of, you know, it was a bit like the, um, I wanted to be sort of the, the conspiracy skeptic version of a uh, skeptoid where, um, mm. you know, you research one topic and then you just kind of, you know, you read what you wrote and that sort of stuff. And then, and then I thought to myself, you know, why not sort of, um, like have guests on and then sort of offload the research to them. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, and that's really helpful. But, um, uh, but, and, and then, um, you know, and, and then I started having, you know, people just write in and say, can you do a, can you do a show on this or do a show on that? And, and then I sort mm-hmm. of thought, well, you know, my listeners, you know, are actually the ones who know the most about the topics they want to cover. So, so instead of, you know, having like, okay, you know, this week I'm going to have the amazing Randy on and next week I'm going to have Michael Shermer, you know, what, so a lot of podcasts always kind of have the, uh, you know, celebrity skeptics doing the podcasting tour because they've got a book. I thought, why not just find like, you know, people like me, like just regular Joes, skeptical Joes out there who, and Josephinas, you know, who, uh, you know, who just, you know, do not have a podcast, you don't have a blog or don't, you know, don't have a TV show and just, just have them on. And, and it's amazing just how many just like lawyers and airline pilots and, and dock workers, you know, are just out there who are just skeptical and smart and just interesting and, and, uh, and, and just have them on to talk about their, you know, their, their favorite conspiracy. Nice. Sounds like you just have some amazing stories to just drop into your lap that way. Oh, oh, for sure. I mean, and you know, it's like, 
I mean, uh, of all my guests, I mean, I've probably met maybe two or three of them in real life, but it's, it's, it's weird. Like the friendships I have sort of formed with, you know, my, my guests, like people who, you know, I almost, you know, maybe if I'm lucky, I meet once every three years, but yeah, you just do meet some really nice people. And, and I guess, you know, one of the sort of major complaints about my podcast are people are like, you don't get to the topic quick enough. Like you just, I just spend the first 20 minutes like, Oh, you're an air, airline pilot, are you? And you know, <laughs> what's that like? And do you get, do you get first class food or do you get the economy class food? You know, I just, <laughs> I, I just want to talk to them about who they are and what they do. And, and that almost makes me think maybe I should stop conspiracy skeptic and just do a podcast where I just talk to skeptics like, Oh, what do you do? You know, and, and it's not really about a skeptical topic. It's just about what they do, you know, and they also happen to be a skeptic. That's why I've always loved our approach. You know, we tell people to, you know, bring a beer and let's have a chat, a, a chat and just yeah. talk about them. You know, sure, we'll cover their stuff that they want to talk about, but let's get to know the person. Yeah, yeah. And, and if because, you know, I have my own podcast, it's like, OK, I'm going to interview you guys. Right. You know, so if I if I start sort of doing that, then, then you, know, <laughs> you, know, you know, a little bit of the old chin music cut me back, you know, and uh, yeah. Carl, Carl, this is our our podcast. So no, 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 it's all good. <laughs> Oh man! No, one time I was uh, it, before we started our podcast. I was uh, I'd been a guest a couple of times on Chariots of Iron, and then I was filling in as a, a guest co-host a few times. And one of those was interviewing uh, Rich and Deanna Joy Lyons of Living After Faith. And then right after interviewing them, like an hour later, I went on and they interviewed me, and it was <laughs> it was weird switching sides. Yeah, I, I did that once with. Um, the guys from cognitive dissonance, we, you, you kind of had, Oh, a, nice. You know, yeah, it, yeah there, there, there's it that called, they, they used to call it, um, there, there was, there was a magazine called spy magazine and it was kind of a, um, like kind of a printed snarky part onion, part wired. It, it, it didn't last long naturally, but, um, uh, and they, they call it log rolling where, um, you know, one author would, um, you know, you know, on one guy's book would, you know, you know greatest book ever. And then, you know, the, the, and that guy would have that, that author, you know, on his dust jacket, greatest book ever. And so they, they call it, I think that the expression is called log rolling. I'll log the good compliment to you and you roll it back to me. And, uh, and so, yeah. So sometimes, you know, skeptical podcasting or atheist podcasting can be a bit of that too, right? Like I'll have you on if you have me on. <laughs> oh yeah. There's yeah. Mm-hmm. Definitely room for, for back scratching. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and one of the uh, great things with it is as far as, driving audience it's more we have you on and then on your podcast you can tell people they can hear all about you on our podcast since a lot of us don't <laughs> talk about ourselves on our own podcast yeah yeah that's true too and it's like also i mean i've been away from you know the, the my own podcast for such a long time i'm 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 actually getting emails from people going, are, are, are you still alive? Because you know, <laughs> people do die. And, I, and yeah. I'm so bad with email. I've not even got back to those people nice enough <laughs> to see if I'm still alive. So they can only conclude I'm dead and I'm not even responding to anybody on my, uh, uh, conspiracy skeptic Facebook page. Oh no. <laughs> oh. So, but I've not heard, you know, word out there like, you know, Carl Mamer, uh, you know, host of conspiracy skeptic. We, we think he's, he's dead or, uh, I think we found the tagline for our episode. Uh huh. Carl Mamer, not dead. Thank you. <laughs> Get the word out there, boys. <laughs> oh, yeah. Using That's it. classic. <laughs> oh, boy. So, how'd you get in? How'd you fall into the skeptics at, at all? I mean, at least I think it's interesting, but, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm 48. How can I ask how old you guys are? 33. 33. 30. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, back, back in my day, it was, there, there was a show called In, in Search Of, which, which yeah, you guys might be old enough to remember it or probably caught it on one of the 350 channels you have on American cable or something like that. But, um, I, I didn't grow up with cable. Oh, all right. Yeah. We were poor. Sorry. No. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was poor too. So, uh, <laughs> but, um, um, but yeah, there was a show called In Search of It, Leonard Nimoy, and it was sort of like, Oh big, God, very, that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very credulous, you know, like, is Bigfoot real? Y- y- yes, but maybe not, but yes, you know, like the, uh, you know, it was, it was definitely sort of, uh, you know, all of their, you know, quote unquote theories were all, um, you know, sort of very, very pro woo and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I, I think as a lot of people of my generation, you know, we watched that show and we just love that show, you know, and, um, 
you know, it's probably getting a bit of the atheism thing too. But you know, when I was I was raised Catholic and I was young and I was like, you know, I, you know, I couldn't wait to almost die because I'm like, you know, when I die. You know, I think heaven's going to be like an in search of episode and, you know, they're going to trot out all the mysteries and there's going to be this Leonard Nimoy voice. And then, but instead of just like leaving the end with like a disclaimer, you know, you know, this may be the answer, but not the only necessarily the only answer, you know, then God's going to come out and go, oh yeah, Kennedy, it was a single bullet. You know, oh, Amelia Earhart, yeah, you know, her plane went down, you know, just off the coast of Tahiti, you know, like you're, you know, and to me, that was like, that was the greatest thing maybe about heaven is that anything you ever, ever wondered about, you know, when you die, it's going to be played out to you like an in search of episode, but they give you the, can I swear? Mm-hmm. Yo, by all means, please. They, we will. They give you the fucking answer, you know what I mean? So, um, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so, um, you know, so that sort of, you know, stokes an interest in the paranormal. And then I went to university and, um, and I was sort of doing a history of psychology course. And then I was like researching parapsychology. And then, and thank you to the librarian who maybe was doing it, you know, you know, irony wasn't like a cultural thing back in the, uh, the eighties. So this guy, maybe the guy who was like, you know, the one guy wearing the ironic beard in the, uh, you know, in the eighties and the ironic t-shirts, but, uh, and he was also like a librarian, or so she was a librarian and, and, um, they, they, um, they catalog, uh, skeptical inquirer right next to the parapsychology journal. So you sort of pull these things out and you start reading skeptical inquirer and you're like, Oh, all right. Of course, you know, they're, they're, you know, you know, psychics and miracles and UFOs and Bigfoot. There is, you know, there's, a, there's a logical scientific answer. And then I just I'm like, Oh, okay. And then I just, pretty much kind of became a, a skeptic um, after sort of reading Skeptical Inquirer. Nice. So did you lose your faith before you you became a skeptic or was it kind of the same time or what? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, you know, if I was sort of raised like a very, um, you know, this very liberal, educated Catholic kind of sort of upbringing. And uh, I always had a joke. My mother, um, because it's true. <laughs> my my mother is like, she's the uh, president of the uh, uh, Catholics w- Women's League, but she's, she's also pro-choice. So you can kind of mm. be, you can kind of be, you know, or in the Catholic school I went to, it was sort of like, well, you do technically have to believe in God to, you know, be a Catholic in the school, but the divinity of Jesus, we're going to kind of leave up to your own sort of, you know, your, 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 your own sort of guesses and kind of thing so so yeah so it's it just all very kind of like liberal and um you know very you know you know t- we were taught evolution in school school and big bang and all that sorts of stuff and so it's just kind of um it just sort of fell away like when you are uh you know you're a child you know santa claus falls away and you know the tooth fairy <laughs> and all that stuff and so i, I think probably the you know the, the nail in the coffin was was really reading frank H- hebert frank herbert's dune mm-hmm. um and, uh, you know, where you're sort of, you know, he sort of takes like, you know, you read that and you go, oh, yeah, this is kind of the Christ mythology. But, you know, with, you know, Paul Atreides and, oh, yeah, OK. So that that was sort of the, the thing that kind of, you know, sort of, sort of totally kicked me over. But uh, that, so, I but where does Sting fit in then? Yeah, I know. Well, that was I. I read Dune before the uh, yeah before the uh, the uh, the, uh, who, the who horrible movie. Yeah, Kyle MacLachlan and uh, <laughs> was it David Lynch? He he made that that Dune movie. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, actually, you know, one of my friends, he was he was like in Catholic school. He was an out. He was probably the only out atheist. Well, he's probably the only out atheist in like 1982, but he was also the, the only out atheist in the Catholic school system in, uh, in my hometown. And then one year he won, it was called the Carrot, Kara, Caritas Award, which is for the, you know, the student who best exemplifies his Christian upbringing. And, <laughs> and he's like, do they know I'm, I'm the eight, uh, the out atheist in the school? And, but didn't, they didn't care. You know, they're like, well, you don't actually have to believe in God to win this. You just have to exemplify, you know, you know, what, you know, what you're supposed to seem like to be a Christian or something. <laughs> like that. Wow. That is all kinds of badass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but I have to, I mean, I, I don't, never experienced any grief. Like my mother is still a believer, but you know, I mean, she's never given me any grief and you know, she, reads, you know, the angry anti-God letters I write to the, you know, the, the local newspaper and stuff like that. And, you know, it doesn't bother her, but, uh, you know, yeah. So it is, that just never, 
you know, like my deconversion story was never really kind of like a, you know, fraught with like tears and being kicked out of the house or anything like that. It was just kind of like, you know, in my, my family just kind of just something that sort of fell away and we never really talked about it. Hmm. You think that's just some of that good kind of wholesome uh, Canadian thing that you got going on? I mean, I mean, partially, I mean, you know, you know, Canadian doesn't quite have the, uh, you know, the separation of church and state and the, uh, you know, the bill of rights. It, a, lot, a lot of our constitution is kind of like, you know, you can say anything you want unless the government says you can't, you know, most of our, 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 our rights are all kind of limited in, in, in that sort of way, like right in the constitution. It, it's kind of like, you know, you know, you, you have all these rights, but you no, know, the government is also allowed to write legislation, you know, for the public well good. And that may supersede your actual rights. So, so we, we don't have mm. sort of those kind of unbounded rights, but at the same time, you know, it, Canadians view religion as very, very kind of very personal thing. And, uh, you know, like, I don't know what religion my prime minister is and mm. no one cares, you know, like, you know, there's oh, no, wouldn't and, that be and, nice. yeah. And politicians don't, they almost tend to shy away from being seen going to church. Cause it's almost sort of like, you know, it, 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 it's just, it looks funny. It's like, well, are you going to start telling me, you know, what I should believe based on, you know, I don't want to elect that kind of politician. Yeah. So, and anybody that's really ever tried to run on this family values campaign is just, you know, failed spectacularly. And so, okay. You know, but whenever I think of Canada, I always think of like, if somebody's going to get a, a, a stern talking to, it's usually going to end with like, begin or end with like a please or a I'm sorry or something, you know, there's like, I'm, I'm very angry, but I'm sorry. I'm angry. Yeah. Or, we, we are, know, it's very, very polite. <laughs> yeah. We are legendary for apologizing. I remember one time I'm, I'm in line for like a play and there's this metal fencing, you know, but you know, for the keep people in line and, um, uh, some guy sort of comes up to the line to like hand out, um, you know, coupons or something like, you know, after the show, come watch and come to this restaurant. And he, he kind of like stubs his toe really bad on the metal fence. I didn't put the fence there, but I apologized to him. And I, I'm pretty sure I also apologized to the fence as well. You know, like, oh, geez, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, but I'm thinking, I didn't put that fence there. I didn't make him come over here. You know, he stubbed his own toe. What do I have to do with anything other than being a mark, you know? <laughs> Take this and come eat, you know, and, like, and, and, uh, but I, I apologize to him. And that's, yeah, we, we kind of have that sort of crazy thing in our culture. But, uh, but I mean, you know, Canadians, I mean, we can be as rude and brutish as, you know, I mean, I've, what's that? Uh, Spokane, you know, like, or, uh, you know, yeah, or, uh, I always think, you know, just as wholesome as like maple syrup and poutine, just like, can I put it, you know, it's going to, it's going to taste really good going down, but it's still going to make you fat. <laughs> yeah. And just like, uh, polite and nice. And yeah. Oh, no, sorry. It was Tacoma. That was the, when, when you lived in Seattle, it was the people in Tacoma yeah. were the ones you kind of made fun of. And well, and oh, yeah. okay. One thing I, I've, I've found with, with Canadians I've known is the super polite ones. Yeah. Usually aren't from Toronto or BC. Oh, Toronto yeah. and BC reminded me attitude wise of Californians. Like Southern Californians. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, bigger, bigger the city gets, the uh, less polite people do get. So, I mean, Canadians are not, we don't live in a lot of big cities. There are not a lot of big cities in Canada. So, a lot of people are kind of living in, you know, cities like a couple hundred thousand people. And, and, and so, yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, um, you know, I, some, when I go to, let's say, like Walmart or Target, which is now leaving Canada, you know, it, I mean, I'm, I'm surprised i don't get a you know a thank you from the cashier but if you you know you go shop in a walmart or target in you know a smaller city it's definitely a very you know very polite and stuff like that mm-hmm. but i'm sorry wait you said walmart or target which one's leaving a tar- tar- yeah target is leaving canada which is kind of disappointing they came oh, here yeah they're, they're they're kind of the um you know um what, what was that last pope uh the one that quit um, Benedict. <laughs> Yeah, Pope Benedict. They're kind of pulling a Pope Benedict. They're kind of like, <laughs> oh, oh, this this is hard. Okay, How weird. We quit. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> it was really weird. They just sort of came here and they're like, so we're going to make fabulous profits after like a year and a half, right? Right? Oh, oh, we're not. Okay, we're leaving. So uh, wow. <laughs> but, 
Which is too bad because okay. I found that the targets I always went to were just very pleasant shopping experience, mostly because no one was there. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, okay, this may be, you know, uh, they may not be long for Canada, but until then, I'm doing all my shopping here because there's nobody in front of me, and it's it's two days before Christmas, you know. And that sounds like <laughs> my experience going to Canada or Canada's, to targets in the U.S. Really, you have that problem huh? too, or nobody's uh, there? I, wow. wow. The one in Tacoma and the one in Silverdale, they're they're always <laughs> packed. The first one I'd ever gone to was in Tacoma and it was it, there was people yeah, there, but you just yeah. walk through and they're they're all out of your way. Yeah. Easy oh, yeah. to do quick I, in I'm and out. I'm actually speaking to you from Tacoma right now. Oh really? So. Oh sorry. Sorry for the Tacoma crack then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't give a fuck. It's no, a, but it was like, it was like the, uh, the, remember those two snipers that were sort of terrorizing Washington, D.C.? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. they, they, were, they, were, they were honing their craft in their backyard in Tacoma. So they're literally in their backyard <laughs> every night shooting away, you know, and, and no one's calling the cops because that's like, what's that, gunfire? That's, oh. that's mostly South Tacoma. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you even in Tacoma, there's somebody you can beat down on then. That's oh, what yeah, you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's South Tacoma. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's when awesome. I when I lived in, in that area, uh, when I lived in Tacoma, I lived up in North Tacoma. Okay. Uh, oh, as mm. far north as you could get and still, well, not be in the water. And I worked in South Tacoma where mm. I literally, we literally had a armed security guard at work. And my vehicle got broken into mm-hmm. right, you know, in a busy parking lot with an armed security guard right there in broad daylight by a busy intersection. Nice. Yeah. You have to go to the South Tacoma to go to the dirt mall, which is always kind of fun though. <laughs> the dirt mall. Yeah. The BNI, uh, basically, you know, you have the, the grand standard malls that have like all the big shopping stores in there. And this one, you know, there might actually, you know, be dirt on some of the floor and you that's where you go to get the the used stuff or the the weird equipment or hmm. uh, yeah, but, t-shirts and all sorts of languages and flea market fun. yeah almost almost yeah, okay we to say the um i mean canadians i mean we can definitely we can be polite but at, at the same time you know we're very sort of insular you know we do kind of kind of keep to ourselves and 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 you know, strangers talking to you is it's it's uh, it's either frightening or suspicious, and and so when I moved to Seattle, I mean that was kind of a big thing I had to deal with, where sort of learning that okay, strangers in Seattle they will just talk to you, like you'll be at a Starbucks and just reading something, and then someone on the table over will just be like, "What are you reading?" And you're like, "Yeah." you talking to me like like it's it's really it's at, at first at first it's disturbing but then it's like you, you sort of realize okay well, well i mean why not do this like why not just say hi to people and like <laughs> hey what are you doing how you doing you know and and, and then you, you you sort of grow to like it it's actually kind of kind of nice you know but but as a canadian it first takes a little bit of getting used to that that sort of i've always so like that friendly yeah yeah that's actually a perfect phrase for it uh yeah. i've always kind of enjoyed that you know, if I was curious about something, exactly that. I'm like, hey, what's going on? Yeah. 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 It would be <laughs> nice if it was more like that in Toronto, but uh, it, it, it's not. Like, it's this, the transportation in Toronto is really terrible. So it's kind of like you go to work, you come home, and, you know, you you don't want to getting up in your business, and, and life is difficult enough, you know. <laughs> oh. Ugh. Reposition. Okay. All right. So you're a 40 year old. 48, 48, 48 yeah 48 oh my goodness man um how long actually have you been doing your podcast because uh, i know you got yeah got well, a few, I, I, I was years into it yeah i um i i was living in 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 seoul korea between uh like basically 2003 and 2008 and that's kind of when podcasting really started to sort of come into its own and mm-hmm. um and, you know, I sort of discovered the skeptic's guide to the universe and, um, you know, Penn, Penn Gillette was sort of doing his own little radio show and it was like a daily show. So I was trying to find a source online to, you know, download those shows. And, uh, and then 
every day is, you know, I'd walk to the subway, I'd sort of you know, be listening and I'm like, man, I should do my own podcast. I should do my own podcast. And then, but I can never think of a topic. And then I sort of realized, oh, wait, you know, where am I? I'm in Seoul. Why not do a podcast about being an expat in Seoul? So I call it Seoul Survivors and had co-hosts. <laughs> it was just sort of about, you know, living and working in Seoul and kind of funny, but also sort of, you know, sane advice. Because a lot of people come to Seoul and they have expectations. And, and so it's like, you know, you, you have to, you know, you have to deal with the whole city with a sense of humor. And, and you know, you, you know, it's like, you know, you go through life sort of being in your own your own country or your own, your own city, kind of like the, um, the, like the average white guy, you know, like, like I, I am background in my city, you know, I can walk into like a Best Buy, grab a TV and just walk out and no one's going to notice me because I am figure ground ambiguous, you know? And <laughs> then suddenly you find yourself on the streets of Seoul and you're like, Oh my God, you know, I'm the only white guy on this street. You know, like I'm now like not figure grand ambiguous. I'm sticking out. And that's like, <laughs> you know, okay, breathe, breathe. That, that can be really disorienting. And, um, so, you know, so it was, yeah, so we did a podcast for a few years about, about, you know, living and working in Seoul. And then, uh, you know, it was going to be moving back to Canada. And then I'm like, well, I should do another podcast. And that's when you're starting to find like, you know, the sort of the niches in, in skeptical podcasting and no one is doing anything with conspiracies. And I kind of really like conspiracy theories and, you know, from a skeptical point of view. And I'm like, conspiracy skeptic there we go so I, I believe i started in 2007 and then i moved back to canada in 2008 so i've kind of been doing it you know off and on since since then okay. i feel you on that soul thing though i lived in uh lived slash worked in japan for about a year and a half and yeah, same just, thing right yeah oh yeah i actually you know i have a kind of a sleeve tattoo on one of my arms and i kind of like showing that off just because i kind of enjoyed the stairs <laughs> yeah because you're, you're yakuza right you know pretty yeah. much it's like it's, it, yeah it's just, just a reserve for yakuza i mean it's probably different now what year what year were you there uh 2010 2011 okay okay so I it's think, been a few years but yeah because i think tattooing in uh i think tattooing in seoul has started to sort of because it was a similar thing there like you know if you had tattoos and you were kind of considered a member of like you know the korean version of the yakuza but uh but yeah you know, the it was definitely saved mostly for their mafia, sure, but it was definitely coming into its own for younger people. Yeah. But actually, gauging and piercing of, of sorts is more common over there than mm. tattoos. Okay, okay. But it, there are actually still places you can't go with tattoos unless you cover them up, like a water parks, family friendly places. Right. So, yeah. Interesting thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the thing I was always found interesting about visiting Japan as compared to Korea is that you know, you know. Korea, I mean, and, and, and I don't want to make like I'm making fun of Korea, but it, you know, it, it seemed like a very much a monoculture, you know, that, that, you know, everybody wears the same, you know, the same in styles and everybody listens to the mm -hmm. same music, you know, they're eating at the same restaurants. And, and whereas you went to sort of Japan, it was like people, there were a lot more subcultures there. And, you know, you know, well, that guy's got a beard, you know, like you'll never see that in, in say, you know, in, in Seoul, like, you know, sort of a, a young guy, you know, working at Starbucks and he's, got a beard you know and, and, and that, that was always sort of very refreshing about japan but hmm. they have a a awesome punk punk culture over there too it's great yeah yeah what was it uh osaka near the castle in osaka i remember it was like every sunday they have uh like free punk shows and and it's just literally there's a stage and then six feet over i i use American measurements too. And then six feet over, there's another stage and another stage. And, and you just have to literally stand in front of each stage in front of their speakers to hear their act. And if you don't yeah. like it, then just, you know, move over <laughs> 12 feet and, you know, listen to that group and stuff like that. But yeah. Hmm. Yeah. It, I, I've never been to Seoul, but yeah, I just love the variation there. I mean, everybody thinks it is. I've always thought that it was very monoculture before I went over there, but couldn't be further from the truth. It was just amazing and fun. It's one of those interesting lessons in, in media, you know, that, um, you know, yeah, when you look at, see Japan through the eyes of like the media, you think everybody there is batshit crazy, right? And you go there and it's like, Oh, the Japanese are just so normal. You know, it's not like about like, you know, they're not like, you know, girls' panties and, and you know, <laughs> machines for purchase and, you Don't know. Don't get me wrong. You can find those there. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you look, yeah, you can look. But it, it's you just get this perception that it's everywhere. And then you kind of realize, too, it's like, oh, you know, 
other countries, you know, say Canada probably have that, you know, that, that view, you know, that, that sort of, that, that, that sort of filter about Canada. So, you know, people might come to Canada and go, oh, there's no log cabins and there's, you know, there are not elk sort of wandering through Toronto and stuff like that, you know? I think of like a decent medical and very polite and lots of uh, fried foods. In in Canada? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, well, I, 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 I always associated fried foods more with like people in the South, of, in, 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 like your... <laughs> Your south, which I always say, in, in, to to a Canadian, the oh, like like anything south of Ohio is the deep south to us. You know? <laughs> so, uh, it's like, Kentucky, yeah, yeah, that's oh, kind of the same. We kind of think the same way, but you know, I'm up in Seattle, so it's not that far north to Canada. So, okay, yeah, yeah. anything south of me is kind of south. No, no, sorry, nothing scares a Canadian more than like looking at a map and going, you know, if not for Ohio. Kentucky be a lot closer to Canada. So. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, it scares. Not, and too, I remember when I was moving to Seattle, it was like everyone's like, "You're gonna be murdered," and I'm like, "Seattle is not Detroit," because I came from my hometown is Windsor, which is right next to yeah. Detroit. So it's like if you only think of America as Detroit, you just think of America is paved with Detroit's, you know. So, but it's <laughs> not. You know? It's like there's places of learning and, you know, yeah. and, and it is just, I mean, Detroit, Detroit is a wonderful city. I love Detroit, the food and the, the culture, the music and the, the sports and all that sort of is, is great. And I even uh, I take my girlfriend there on her birthday for vacation, you know, and stuff like that. You know, honey, where do you want to go for your birthday? I think maybe we're going to Detroit. Really? <laughs> no, it's better. It's better than it sounds. But yeah. But wow. um yeah. So, uh, and, and the other thing too, I think living abroad is, um, you, you don't sort of realize it, but you know, your own culture has your own sort of internal myths. You know, these, these myths we tell each other, like we are a good and moral people, you know, you know, we are better than other people. And, and, and it's interesting how, you know, when you go to other countries, you know, they have those exact same myths, but they, you know, they, they erase out Canada or America and they write in, you know, Korea or Japan or Kazakhstan or whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. So I definitely, definitely recommend anybody, if you ever get a chance to sort of live and work in a whole different country, you know, that do it. It's, it's, it's amazing how it kind of sort of opens your eyes to your own country's internal propaganda. Oh yeah. It's, I spent six weeks in Jordan and there the, uh, you see the propaganda everywhere. The King's face is always around yeah well, the other thing too is like my, like my american friends like I mean, if you go up to canada you know you'll like, like I, I, I had people american friends who had when i was living in seattle they'd go up to say vancouver and they'd just be like you know your canadian flags are everywhere it's really just you know, like you know you guys are just like you know you know just sort of disgusting with your canadian flags everywhere and i'd be like <laughs> really like but that's that's our complaint about america you go to america and they just, they, they just have their american flags everywhere they're just waving it everywhere and we don't have canadian flags everywhere and then you kind of realize oh you know you don't really notice your own flags right it's only till you go to another country that you notice oh they've got a different flag and it's flying everywhere and, mm-hmm. and you don't think <laughs> your own country and then you go to, you know so i uh, you know i i always sort of challenge my canadian friends to sort of pipe up about that i'm like just you know Next time you walk down that street, ask yourself, how many Canadian flags do you think there are? And you'd think, well, none. And then really actually count. How many Canadian flags do you see on, like, you know, your, your trip from home to work? And, you know, that's like my trip. I'd see, like, you know, 20 Canadian flags. You just – but you never notice them because it's to you, like I say, it's background, right? You know, where is the nearest fire hydrant or where is the nearest uh, fire extinguisher in your office? You know, it's just, it's just background until you're in a different environment. Then you, then you notice. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. <laughs> I always have this uh okay, I'll preface this. I work for the government and every morning at eight in the morning they play the national the national anthem. And I always they always play it through these really tinny, horrible speakers, and it echoes for miles. Or literally miles. And I always have this kind of dystopian kind of uh nineteen eighty two kind of Orwellian sense to it because it just feels so propaganda y and mm. like, you know, the, the great country that, you know, kind of like what I always envisioned, you know, the USSR as. 
just these horrible speakers playing this crap song. Well, not saying it's a crap song, but it just sounds like shit. And it's kind of a weird feeling. Just to mm. p- toss that out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, so coming back to the religion topic, it's like... Um, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what what are you doing <laughs> is the... Uh, car- <laughs> Carl, Carl pontificating on, uh, <laughs> on 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 different urban centers around the world. Um, no, the uh, yeah yeah. Let's like to even at work. Like I mean, I, I, you, you give it work. Like I would never expect any of my coworkers to ever sort of like um, you know like talk about religion or want to know what church I go to or you know stuff like that. And and but I mean, I would definitely heard sort of in you know in the states. Like it's like you know that's the you know, that's almost like like. Um, just like, even like a greeting, like, hey, how are you? What church do you go to? Oh, yeah. You, you move into a new community. That's kind of expected. Somebody's going to ask you that, especially if you're <laughs> down south. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. But, yeah. So, you yeah. know, again, I work for the government, uh, which I would hope this means a little bit more. Uh, when I turn around from my desk and look, you know, back 180 degrees from where I sit, I see a very large, like, foot and a half by three foot long sign saying he is risen. <laughs> and who put and, uh, that up? <laughs> uh, yeah, one of my coworkers, uh, the the fundamentalist uh, in in my office. It's my it's office. awesome. Yeah. Well, I, in, I mean, I in know, a government office. Well, and one of my coworkers. I mean, she she is kind of very religious. And uh, what did one day we're sort of starting a meeting, and she was running a little bit late, and I just I just like I I forget what it was, but I'm just like. Jesus Christ, you know, reacting to a point in a meeting. And then just as I say that, she sits down right next to me and I'm like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, I, yeah, I didn't mean to offend your God, but. <laughs> uh, oh, boy. At least she in Drama Muhammad. Yeah. But, you know, one of the interesting things, though, in Canada is, um, not, 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 might not be across Canada, but at least I, I know in Ontario, like r- literally written into our constitution is, uh, is sort of a guarantee that you, that, uh, the government will fund Catholic education. No other religion, mm. but Catholic education constitutionally gets funded in, in Ontario. I didn't know it was only uh, Catholics. Just Catholics. I mean, it, it's just kind of a, you know, when Canada was sort of trying to pull together as its own country, because we, we were kind of afraid of like an invasion from the States because you guys had just sort of, you know, kicked the British out and then sort of the last, you know. And had bastion. already invaded Canada. Yeah. So the last bastion of, uh, you know, British forces in North America were up in Canada. So, you know, there was the, always the danger, you know, you would sort of push that out. So, so Canada sort of, you know, sort of put, wanted to pull together as its own country and to get all these different provinces to, and, and different sort of social factions to sort of, uh, you know, become a country, you know, they had to sort of say, oh, okay, well, Catholics, you know, you can have, uh, you know, we'll, we'll pay for your, cause it was very British, uh, Canada was controlled, you know, by the British or former British people. So, and the Catholics tended to be, so the French Canadians. So, so by guaranteeing, uh, you know, Catholic certain certain rights. You know, then it was make sure that you know French Canadians were kind of on board with the whole country thing. So, is that kind of like how the French language has to be on everything, but English yeah. not necessarily? Yeah. Well, yeah. We have, like we have so two official languages in, in two official languages in Canada, French and English. And I believe that the interesting thing about the states is the states does not have an official language, right? They kind of mm-hmm. just sort of go whatever is going to make you the most money, you know, just to operate in that <laughs> language. And, you know, it's probably English, but, you know, it doesn't have to be. But um, just as long uh, as it's not Spanish. Yeah. Well, yeah. unless you're yeah. in <laughs> southern Arizona and southern New Mexico, where from the Gatson Purchase, part of the deal with that was Spanish had to be available and recognized in that area. Oh, OK. Yeah. All right. I, I, so, I was just saying that there's so much pushback against, you know, press one for English, press two for Spanish. Oh, yeah. Really, people get ornery about that. Oh my goodness, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was a bit like in, um, you know, Quebec this, or. My, oh, go ahead. This is America. Yeah. <laughs> we speak American, but uh, I mean, uh, our Quebec, sort of the, the French Canadian province, is uh, uh, lang- language rights and French are taken very seriously there. It's very, very political, and. Uh, so, um, so, you know, a lot of stop signs will, will have like the French and English, you know, stop, arrête, as if, you know, just having stop, you would never guess what that, you know, this, 
red octagon, <laughs> you know, with four <laughs> letters, you know, hey, what's it telling me there? So they would, you know, say stop, aret. And, uh, you know, depending on what neighborhood you're in, you know, one of those words would be spray painted out on every sign in the neighborhood. <laughs> so, you know, so stop nice. was sort of just spray painted out. Then it's like, okay, I'm going to, my grade school French, I'm going to have to try and use it here if I get a, you know, a breakdown or something. And, and, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, um, but yeah, yeah. So everything's in French and English yeah, legally, but, um, the different provinces also have their own sort of rules. So like, as you kind of head out West, like Alberta, Alberta is like our Texas basically. And they wear cowboy boots out there and stuff like that. And, uh, and yeah, oh, it, awesome. you know, yeah, like you will not probably find them very friendly to bilingual anything, but, um, yeah, but, but in general, like packaging laws and all that sort of stuff. But I mean, it, the amount of French I can speak is very little. Uh, I even gr- grew up in, uh, Quebec. So I <laughs> went to like French school and, but, um, mm. you know, my, I, yeah, I do not have a, 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 really a talent for a language other than English. Yeah. And I, I've, I spent a little bit of time in, in Quebec, uh, actually on two separate occasions. And what I always found interesting was how right around the Montreal airport, every sign was bilingual. You get three miles out and it's all French. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well that's Quebec itself um, is, they are monolingual, like, like legally. And then that's, and that's where that, I was saying that constitution thing come in, comes in where it's like, you know, you know, uh, you know, you, you, French and English is the official language of Canada on, you know, unless you really, really don't, want it it's it we, we, it's it's called the notwithstanding clause so so any so if we were to say sort of say okay you know you can't lock up atheists you know that the, the supreme court of canada has ruled that that law you're trying to pass quebec that locks up atheists uh that is unconstitutional life liberty you know you cannot deny them and then quebec can say okay uh notwithstanding we really really want to lock up atheists and then the supreme court goes Oh, okay. Well then be my guest, you know, and, and that's a, that's a little creepy, but wow. you know, you, you, you kind of hope that ultimately, you know, cooler heads will always prevail. But, uh, th- I think that the only real, um, then the federal government, the only kind of, you know, cudgel they can kind of use is saying, okay, well, you know, let's say we give you, you know, a billion dollars a year and, uh, w- you know, now we don't have to give you a billion dollars a year. It's kind of like, in the states, like the federal government gives each of the individual states money for their highways, right? Mm-hmm. And then yeah. they, yeah, then they kind of tend to use that a lot of times for like, okay, you, every, you, you know, you, you want these funds, then your drinking age has got to be 21. You know, you want these funds, then, you know, the blood alcohol content's got to be, you know, this amount or something like that. So, mm-hmm. so, you know, so I always thought that was kind of interesting, the states, how they kind of c- can use those sort of federal transfer dollars to sort of, uh, get states on side for for certain things well and that yeah in particular was because for alcohol it's explicit in the 21st amendment that the states have the right to regulate alcohol right yes yes that's explicitly delegated Uh, as far as states trying to get out of following stuff that was a pretty common thing Uh, and if the state really wanted to do it the federal government let them until the civil war or you could use just use the uh, speed limits uh, basically, for those federal highway dollars, the you can have whatever speed limit you want to, but if you want those dollars, you're probably looking at you know 55 or 60 uh, yeah. as a speed limit. Well, that was during the, the 70s, I think. It was, was it Carter who brought in the, uh, or it could have been the guy before Ford. So someone brought yeah. in like you know 55, right? All the highways were 55, and which was that song I can't drive 55, but. Um, um, yeah, and then they, and then they kind of sort of loosened it up a bit after they sort of. It was originally the oil shock. They they wanted mm-hmm. to sort of, you know, sort of uh, lower, it, you know, foreign imports, and then and then once you know there was this oil glut, they re looked at it and they're like, wow, highway traffic deaths have just gone down tremendously. With you know, so we're going to keep the fifty five, not because it's about oil. Now it's about reducing you know traffic deaths, and then I, I, then I think they sort of let states have more control over their speed limits and i think it was montana for a while montana just got rid of speed limits it was sort of like yeah they just said drive safely yeah exactly whatever is prudent or something like that Mm -hmm. was their their basic rule drive at a speed that is reasonable and prudent yeah and then uh but i i don't know but they they did eventually have a uh, a speed limit because probably because you know 
people were like doing you know 100 miles per hour in the, winter and the exact like, case on that was uh someone was dry, got pulled over for doing i think it was 110 on the two-lane road the officer thought that speed was not reasonable or prudent the driver thought it was <laughs> And so the officer did issue a citation and the driver uh, went to court and took it all the way to the state Supreme Court. And the state Supreme Court said, uh, you can't have a, a arbitrary standard like that. And so that forced the state to go with the current scheme they have, which is a uh, mix of daytime and nighttime speed limits. So that guy fucked it up for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Well, what, I, I mean, one of the things is, uh, yeah, Canadian, where if, if we have a, a majority government where, you know, one, one party has like the most, uh, like seats in parliament, it, 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 in that sense, for four or five years, it gives them, it gives them, uh, almost absolute power. Uh, the Supreme Court, you know, obviously can review things, but you're, it's, it, it's like you're sort of electing an absolute monarchy for, let's say, four or five years. And, um, it, like we don't have a constitution, we don't have like an election every you know, November, every four years, or something like that. Like, it's kind of whenever the party wants to call it, but mm. after four or five years, then they have to call it. But mm. um, but anyway, so but uh, which then lets people, you know, governments kind of tax and spend, tax and spend, raise taxes, and there's there's you know, and there's nothing you can do. When I was living in Seattle, that you have the um, like ballot measures, right? So the mm-hmm. average. Joe, you know, gets enough signatures, you know, they can throw something on the ballot. And, uh, and then it, I was living there when they just got rid of the, uh, it was, it was like a tax on your car. If you want to get your license plate, you had mm-hmm. to pay like, like 15% of your blue book value every year, which, you know, if you had a Porsche, that was, that was, a, you know, that was a big hunk of money. And that, and, and so in lieu of a state income tax, that was their income tax. And then somebody, Somebody had a referendum on the ballot and said, no, we just want to pay 55 bucks some, you know, a year. And that was voted in and was wildly popular and they had to get rid of that tax. And I'm like, wow, you know, people can just rise up and get rid of a tax they don't like. Like that thought that was kind of impressive. But then, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. the, you know, the, the viaduct started falling apart and the <laughs> highway started falling apart. And, and I'm like, well, yeah, I see the other flip side of that, that, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes you do want governments to sort of go, okay, I know this sucks, but, uh, you know, teachers are leaving in droves for California. So we, we need money to pay them better and, you know, things like that. So, yeah. You know, and then you get places like Oregon where they're afraid to raise the taxes, but need to. And so they just leave it up to the voters and they yeah, refer well, it to the voters every time. And what, what do the voters do? They always vote it down. <laughs> somebody but, else's problem you know you know on the plus side though that that's how washington state got uh marriage equality going though so you know we put it to the to everybody and you know hey yeah well well i always like the notion too where it was the um like people in eastern washington want to be their own state right because they just feel like <laughs> Western mm-hmm. Washington politically, like there's more voters out there and they have a lot more political power and Eastern Washington is a lot more conservative and, and religious and, you know, they feel like they're not well represented. So they, they kind of want to make their own state. Yeah. I kind of don't blame them, but you know, <laughs> there, there's always been talk of like, what, what is it? Pacifica, like the right, country yeah. of taking like Oregon, Cascadia, uh, West Cascadia, uh, Oregon part, uh, you know, the Western part of Washington and some, you know, fuck it, we're going to take some of uh, Vic PC too. Yeah, and just <laughs> just make our own country. Yeah, well, there's like, there's the the small Cascadia, and then there's the larger Cascadia, which like goes all the way out to the Rockies. <laughs> yeah, like, fuck it, we're going to make our own country, and yeah. we're taking Canada with us. Discovery Institute. I mean, don't, one of their isn't one of their wings like the oh, the, sort of a research group for that. Basically, that I think they call it like transportation like they're just like cascadia or something like that they're just really concerned about transportation issues but you know that may be more of a cover for you know we want to have this you know pacific northwest theocracy and you know that that sort of thing but at some point microsoft sort of donated the the that wing of discovery institute they donated money to them but microsoft i think was just under the impression they were just studying you know transit in you know, in, in the Pacific Northwest. And when mm. they sort of found out that, oh, no, it's like these creationists, you know, it was quite embarrassing. So, 
Oh, Oops. damn. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they have their offices like downtown Seattle too. It's kind of sad. Mm-hmm. Well, do you, do you, do you, do you walk by them or, uh, uh, no, they're up on like the 10th, 20th floor, but you can go to their office and it's just a little shitty hole in the wall place. I mean, it's nothing special. Yeah. Just a couple people in an office, not this great grand thing like everybody would think it is. Yeah, there's the uh, the Scientologists have a building uh, in downtown Toronto, and you sort of I love sort of walking by them, and every now and then there's somebody out in front, and they're trying to get you to go in for their free personality test. And I look at this like office tower, and summertime, all the windows are open, and there's like no air conditioners, and I'm just like, well, you know, when you're OT eight, you don't need an air conditioner or something. So I don't know, but it, yeah, but uh, they're 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 an interesting cast of characters. Let's take a quick break for a word from a new podcast, My Secular Savior. You can find them at mysecularsavior.com. Have you ever felt lost? Depressed. Angry. Raging. Have you ever thought of hurting yourself? Are you thinking of hurting yourself? Do you just feel like no one is listening, that no one is hearing you? Then this podcast might be for you. We've both struggled. We've both fought demons. Music was there to help us through so many difficult times. Music spoke to us when no one else would. Music helped us cope with the raw emotions that boiled inside us when no one else could reach us that deeply. Music was my savior. Music was my savior. We want to build a community of people who rely on secular measures to deal and cope with life's challenges. We want to reach into the corners of the world to find those who feel voiceless and alone. Each one of us walks a path in life. None of us need to walk it alone. You want to find out more about My Secular Savior? Go to MySecularSavior.com or look for them wherever you find podcasts. And now back to the interview. All right, let's let's change gears a little bit. Sure. Uh, Carl, what is your favorite conspiracy theory? Oh. Uh, you know, my, my favorite one is always the, um, uh, H A H I V denial. Um, mm. mostly because like you're with, with creationism, you're, you know, you're, you're very used to call it the big tent approach. Like a lot, a lot of conspiracies, um, and, you know, sort of pseudosciences and stuff like that. They, they have this big tent approach. So, you know, you can be a Jehovah's witness, but as long as you, you know, I've written a book that uh, attacks evolution, you, you know, boom, you're in the fold, right? that the creationists do not kind of attack each other. Like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a Southern Baptist and I believe in young earth and, you know, you are a Mooney and you believe in young earth, but we're all together on this, you know, big tent. No, they're not whacking at each other, which I find really surprising. But, um, but in, in the sort of the HIV denial, there's different camps and, and they go at each other as viciously as they go after, you know, quote unquote, big pharma or something like that. Mm. So, yeah, I, I remember, listening to like a uh, kind of an interview debate or something like that between there's one guy, I think his name was Dues, Duesberg. He was one of the first big real, you know, uh, you know, HIV denialists. And, and, uh, and he's sort of in the camp that, you know, there is a virus called HIV, but it's, it's harmless that, um, you know, AIDS is caused by drug abuse and that sort of stuff. And, and, um, and then this other guy, I forget what his name was, but he was like a, basically he's a dentist. And, uh, and, and his view was that, uh, you know, there's not even a virus called HIV and, and that this is, um, you know, that this, or no, no sorry, he, he believes there's a virus called HIV, but it was, it was invented by, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, biological agents in mm-hmm. the army who are out to depopulate the earth or something like that. And, uh, and it was, you know, and listening to this, this sort of interview with the both of them, they were just going at each other viciously. Like the, the dentist guy was like, you know, I am, you know, the, you know, the genetic descendant of Jesus Christ and King David. And I've got this <laughs> knighthood in this organization, you know, for only a thousand dollars, they'll make you a knight. And, you know, and he's just <laughs> wailing away on this dude. And I am charging you under the authority by being, you know, the blood relation of Jesus with treason against the universe. And, and, <laughs> and the other guy, this dude's I mean, he was like, just like this old, crazy old man by now. And he's just kind of just sitting there going, waiting for the guy to go silent. And then like, and this other paper by this guy and, you know, and, uh, and, 
at this university <laughs> in Germany, he found this about the HIV. You know, he's not even like, and it was just, it was just beautiful. And and I'm like, yeah, that's 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 kind of a fun conspiracy where the conspiracists themselves actually, you know, are in wow. groups and they attack each other. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is rich. That is awesome. <laughs> You know, but I mean, even sure, like the nine eleven. I mean, even probably the nine eleven truthers, right? I mean, it's like, you know, if you think they aimed a big particle weapon at the two towers, and you know, you think, uh, you know, it was a robot controlled plane, we're all together. You know, it's just, you know, as long as it's not the, you know, the the, the, the official story kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is a pretty fascinating distinction. Yeah, you know? and I mean, the other interesting thing about. I mean, you know, HIV is, uh, you know, it's like a, it was like a puzzle, right? Like, well, you know, where did it come from? And, you know, we sort of detected it in, uh, so basically like the gay population. I mean, that's why it was, it was, it was unfortunate that gay people sort of were the population where it was detected in because it was kind of like, it was in the population, but, um, but, you know, once they sort of noticed this cluster of sort of cancer in, in gay populations, it's sort of rare cluster. They're like, Oh, okay. Well, why are gay people all getting this rare cancer? And eventually they sort of found out, figured out about AIDS, but it sort of had been in the population, but we, we just didn't really notice it. And so trying to figure out, well, when, when did it really first appear? And, you know, they can track it back to like, I think like, like 1920 or something like that. So it's just like, it's just a really fascinating, um, you know, when you study the conspiracy, it's just kind of a fascinating, uh, story, you know? Mm hmm. As I was sort of say, I mean, one of the, you know, I mean, like, let's like, let's say, let's say, like, you know, atheism or or skepticism, uh, like, you're probably, you know, you're you're never going to convince your friend not to be a Christian, right? And yeah. I'm not going to ever be able to talk somebody out of being, like, a 9/11 truther or something like that. But but I always felt like the why why do you do it is because these people always they they challenge your basic assumptions, right? I you know. I go through life thinking the world is 4.5 billion years old. And then someone comes along and says, no, it's not. It's 6,000. And then you're like, oh, yeah. Well, how do we know that, right? How do we know what we know? And then by them posing these really obtuse questions, you know, now you got to clickety-clickety and go on Google and you have to research this. And you, you learn so much about everything. So so I, I always – I like talking to these people, not because I think I'm ever going to convince them otherwise, but – you know, the, you, 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 in, in, in trying to, by, by them sort of challenging your basic assumptions, you, you sort of learn, like, you know, how we know what we know. Hmm. Yeah. I've, I've not ventured much into conspiracy theories. Uh, I've got a, a brother that's pretty big into them, but. Is that because he believes them or? I have a hard time telling if he's just trying to be funny or if he actually thinks it's the oh, truth. No. Okay. <laughs> what is it? Yeah, I, I, I kind of, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say that, you know, that, yeah, that, you know, like, um, I mean, sometimes you'll, you'll, you will meet people who are like, well, I'm a skeptic and you're like, oh, great. You know, and they're like, yeah, I think, you know, the government, you know, is behind 9-11 and then you're like, oh, okay, you know, you're, you're using that word wrong. You know, that, that some people <laughs> sort of think that it's like, you know, always doubting the official story is, you know, is sort of a skeptic and, 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 and you sort of, and, and, and again, that itself sort of makes you go, well, what, you know, well, what is a skeptic, right? You know, it's not, you know, you sort of discover, okay, so it's not doubting the official story. It's sort of going, it's like, Carl, what does Carl Mamer know about HIV? I'm, I am not a virologist, right? You know, I don't know anything. And, and so it's like, so when someone makes a sort of a claim, you know, and you go, well, you know, who are the experts? And it's like, okay, well, if, you know, if, all of these people who are virologists, you know, all across the world, you know, they all sort of seem to agree on, you know, one sort of basic, you know, idea, then it's like, you know, that, that's the one I got to go with, right? You know, I'm not in the business of trying to interpret a body of research as, you know, I've got a BA in psychology. I do not have the qualifications and, you know, and any more so if, you know, I went to three mechanics and they said, yeah, you know, just don't, you know, you just put regular unleaded in your car. You're not getting a performance boost from, you know, you know, the, the, the super unleaded or whatever. Then I'm going to go, okay, you know, I'm going to go with their, uh, I'm going to go with their recommendation. So, yeah. So, I mean, that, that uh, it's, um, yeah, it, it, it does, you know, sort of like also challenge you to figure out, well, what is a skeptic, right? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> <clears throat> 
Because, yeah, like the, just... the climate change skeptics, <laughs> most of yep. them definitely aren't. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that, that's yeah, the other, even the co-opting of the term right, skeptic has become kind of a, just as sort of the, um, you know, a lot of sort of the, you know, the, the you know, the, the 9-11 truthers and the denialists and all those people, they, they, they themselves have started like, you know, you know, studying up on all the informal logic terminologies, you know, straw man and post hoc or go proper, you know, they, they start sort of throwing these things around and then you're like, Oh no, <laughs> you know, they're not only are they using it wrong all the time, but you know, it's, it's, it's they just sort of think it just like straw man, you know, and then uh, arguments over and, you know, you know, <laughs> imp- improper appeal to authority and, you know, that, that sort of stuff. But I mean, I have to sort of say that, um, you know, it's sort of like, I, I mean, I'm kind of almost sort of, uh, not, not getting out of the skeptical community, but sort of like, you know, skepticism has kind of lost a lot of its, not on its thrill, but I, I guess maybe with all the, you know, all the internal fighting and all that sort of stuff that it's kind of like, oh God, you know, like wake me, wake me up when we can all get along again, like we used to. But, but uh, not, not that there's not, yeah. you know, you know, there, I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of sort of, you know, good reason that, you know, people are sort of battling things out for that. But, you know, I mean, I have been sort of, sort of, I don't know, kind of in terms of the podcasts I listen to, it's more like kind of atheist podcasts these days and like skeptical podcasts. So I'm just kind of like gravitating towards that a little bit more. I, I don't know if, you know, the atheist community, well, I mean, atheism and skepticism, you know, they, they tend to go hand in hand, but of course there are, you know, there are very important distinctions. And so it's, it's hard to sort of say, well, is, is atheism all, you know, are they experiencing all of the, you know, the, the, the wars that, that, that skepticism is, or is it just all part of the whole same thing? I I think definitely uh, we there's been a lot of infighting in the skeptics community, and yeah. I think that definitely damages us as a whole. But yeah, I don't I don't think I think uh, atheist podcasts have come out pretty unscathed in that. Yeah, uh, it seems to be the bloggers and YouTubers that have gotten more in on the fighting. But let me, actually, let me rephrase that: they are the ones doing the fighting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because if you ever want to resolve any issue, you just the comment section on a YouTube, uh, mm-hmm. a YouTube, but that is that is where you're going to get deep thinking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. There are Twitter. <laughs> God, you can do anything in 100, 140 characters. I, I, I it's one of these things. I, I swear, I have to cut and paste sometimes. But um, I, I'm, my my pet peeve is where you're sort of like debating with somebody, and then they're like, you're like, well. You know, how do you know that? You know, and they're like, well, then they give you a link to like a 45 minute poorly produced YouTube video. And they're like, it's all answered here. Peak oil. It's all explained here. And you're like, Oh God. So, so my, 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 my response is always, okay. I, you know, I can't look at that video right now. And I, you know, I, I will eventually find 45 minutes to devote to watching your awful awfully produced, you know, YouTube video. But before I watch it, can you first, you know, summarize what is it about? And can you sort of maybe list, you know, the, the, the three best arguments it makes? Or, you know, what, what do you think are the three best arguments that it makes? And then people will invariably reply, you know, well, just watch the video. I'm not going to do your research for you. And then you're like, okay, <laughs> you know, so here's the thing. I could watch that video for 45 minutes. And the things I find compelling you may not find compelling, right? So, so if you can tell me what are the three things you find compelling, then I can pay attention to those. Mm-hmm. And I have literally never gotten anybody to respond, ah, okay, well, you know, where he introduces, you know, this line of evidence and, you know, this, this doctor says this and, you know, this study was, you know, I have never gotten anybody to ever answer that question. They're always just like, I'm not going to do your research for you. Like, and I'm like, really? Do people like, people who post YouTube videos as like evidence of something like, like it's amazing that they, they, when challenged, they can't really ever just step back and go, yeah, what do I find compelling about that video? Should ask that person. Did you actually watch the video? <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. And sometimes, sometimes I'll just, I'll just, when, when, when they come back with that second, when they're just sort of repeating, I'm not going to do your research for you. I'll just sort of reply like, okay, guys, I watched the video and you know what? I found nothing compelling in it. Could you tell me what you found compelling? In it? <laughs> yeah, come come back an hour later. Like, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
there's nothing there's nothing so and even then they can't answer anything so just yeah and i i I actually had one uh i was sort of arguing with a uh uh you know a theist about something or another and and, for some reason he thought that there was no way plants could evolve because they evolved before the sun was created (laughs) <laughs> and then I'm, I'm like, no, 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 right. no. The, the sun came first, and then a plants eventually evolved. It's a big body of research on plant evolution. And then he's like, well, you will then explain it, and and no and no YouTube videos. And I'm like, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this will mean this argument. Of course, later on, he as an answer you know, as sort of evidence for his claim, he gives me a YouTube video. <laughs> nice, nice. The plants coming before the sun is from the, the, the you know Genesis account, uh, Genesis yeah, chapter exactly. one. And if you believe that is the truth and the only truth, then, well, obviously the, the plants came before the sun, so you couldn't have them evolve. Yeah, exactly. It's the, the circular logic there. Yeah. But it was interesting with, sort of debating with him, too, where it's sort of like, well, explain it, you know, explain how the sun just got here. And then I'm like, okay, well. Here's my explanation. You know, all these stellar, you know, nebula, they all sort of gravity pulled, you know, the, the matter together and the you know, fusion and the sun and then the matter outside the sun, you know, that formed planets and da, da, da. I'm like, there you go. Okay. Now, what do you find? Where is your problem with that? You know, please give me specifics. What is your issue with that? And then again, it's just like, well, the Bible said it didn't happen that way, you know, like, which is always sort of interesting. So you, sometimes you, it's like, <laughs> You know, it's like, okay, or, or, you know, like, but, you know, Kent Hovind says this, and then it's like, okay, well, you know, that, I'm like, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting hypothesis, right? You know, that's, wait, that's how Kent Hovind explains these observations. But, you know, what has he done to establish that's true? You know, this vapor cloud, you know, what has he done to establish there was a vapor cloud, you know, cause, you know, cause there could be three other viable answers to explain, you know, why Brachiosaurus is, could breathe or something like that, you know, like maybe they just had efficient hearts or maybe there was a higher oxygen content at that time or something. It didn't have to be a vapor cloud creating this overpressure that got more air into these dinosaurs or something. And, and then it's like, you know, so how do I choose between those three? Like, I mean, you choose that one because that just confirms the Bible, but how am I supposed to choose between those three? Or maybe none of them are correct. And the best answer to go with is what we just don't know yet. You know, if, a sock is missing. I find I don't know more comfortable than you know the sock stealing fairy. You know that mm-hmm. that sort of thing. But the the vapor cloud and stuff like that that's worse than just well the Bible says because that's actually just some guy recently made it up. Yeah, yeah. Demonstrably, very recently that someone made that up up that idea, pulled it out of thin air, pulled it out of the vapor, if you want to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so what you're saying is uh, Mormonism and Scientology. Yeah, yeah. And all of the cargo cults. Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> mm. I'm vaping here. Sorry. I am too. <laughs> uh, so I, I actually, and I, I've got a half ohm dripper. I'm I'm blowing clouds right now, so I do have a, a vapor cloud that I'm in. <laughs> yeah, Meredith's front living room is all kind of a little hazy. <laughs> You got any bad habits, Carl? Uh, bad habits. Oof. I, I, I'm a nail biter. I'm one right. of those. Yeah, I mean, I've since I was a boy, and I just it's just something I can never ever stop, and it probably leads to me having a lot of you know common colds every year. But hmm. um, just never, yeah, I just never able to sort of beat the nail biting habit. And uh, but other than I, I mean, there could be worse worse habits or something like I don't know. My hometown got a casino, and I sort of saw how people were like you know, became like gambling fiends and stuff like that. And, you know, some things I'll go to the casino with my aunt and, you know, my, my rich aunt who I want to keep in my good books and or sure, sure. Be in her good books, you know, that kind of <laughs> my, my rich aunt without children who I want to keep in my, in, in the, her good books. I'll go with her to the casino and, you know, I'll just bet $20 on the slots. And, and once it's gone, it's like, so can I buy you a coffee, Aunt Janice? And, you know, <laughs> I'll tell you what, as far as your nails go, I was a big nail biter myself until I started getting manicures. 
Then I'm like, screw this. I'm paying for it to, for these people to make my nails look nice. I stop biting really quick. But you, but you have to have nails to get the manicure, don't you? I mean, like you have to let the, n- n- the nail stuff go beyond the, the skin to make. Because <laughs> I can't. I, you know, the only time I was ever able to stop biting my nails is one year right after I came back from Disney World. When, one, one year I was like so stress free that I just didn't need to bite my nails. Like it was a very relaxing vacation. I should point mm-hmm. this out. My, my, my American friends always find this curious. One day I was like talking about Florida, I, I, apparently in like favorable terms. And he's like, what is it with you Canadians in Florida? Like, why do you all seem to think Florida <laughs> is the greatest spot on earth? And I'm like, yeah, Canadians, we love Florida. Like Florida is the, the promised land to Canadians. And, and, uh, we, we, we enjoy vacationing there. Wow. Hmm. I, I just thought that was like the second Israel. Yeah, it's, no. If, if you're rich and Jewish, you either move, move back to Israel or Florida when you're old. <laughs> well, I, think I always think, too, so Florida is like, okay, Florida's got to be one of those places where, you know, it, it's nice to visit, but do you, do you really want to live there? Because if you, if you live there, because, you know, it's like Canadians work to earn money to go to Florida. And that, that is, that is, that is our existence. And, wow. but if you're, if you're living in Florida and it's like, okay, I got a couple of weeks vacation. Where do I go? Like, where, like, where do Florida people go on vacation? Like they, De- definitely not Canada, not Canada. <laughs> you know, it's like, Hey, let's go to California, or Disney hmm. and ocean and palm trees. <laughs> no. Okay. Well, let's go someplace hotter. And, no, it's not good. You know, like say, so yeah, I'm like, I was like, where do Florida people go? So that's, that's why they're shooting each other, right? Because it's, it's just they do not <laughs> have any place to go for relaxing vacations. And, oh, God. You need to get on Twitter and follow at Florida, man. <laughs> really? Okay. That is the worst, most fucked up Twitter <laughs> ever. Just taking articles about Florida, man, does X. This, that, that. It's amazingly sad and funny. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will follow me on my, my, my Twitter is, uh, I think it's the, the, the porn stash, <laughs> my, my, my official Twitter. Like really? I had one, yeah. The porn stash. Yeah. You know, Twitter.com forward slash the porn stash. And, uh, and that's so what I just usually, usually, I, I mostly use that to rage at the producers of the strain. I think that's my, this is my primary function because they filmed the strain in Toronto, which is set in New York. And so one of my friends goes, Hey, I'm a, I'm a tough New York cop, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and but everything about the strain it's like no like no one lives in brownstones and there's just nothing in these scenes that look like new york or look like you know new york uh and sometimes you'll see like wow you know residential streets in new york have like speed limits of 40 miles per hour when it's actually 40 kilometers per hour they just didn't you know, they just didn't <laughs> remove the sign for the shot and stuff like that. And, and it's just like, Oh God, come on. So I'll just tweet at the producers of the strain and I'm like, Oh, you know, come on. This is really, this is Toronto. You didn't even work hard to remove something that was obviously Toronto, like, you know, the speed signs and stuff like that. <laughs> or like, you know, the like Canadian flag and grand central station. And <laughs> well, I, I'm looking at your, your Twitter feed right now and it's mostly just pictures that you retweeted. Oh, the, uh, the, oh, he got I, called out. Okay, well, wait, hang, on, hang on. You may be not looking at the right one. That, the <laughs> porn stash. Okay. Uh, Twitter. Let's see. Twitter. Hmm. Let's see. What is, the, what is, what is, what is, what is my last tweet? What does Carl rage about? <laughs> yeah. Americans come together to celebrate MLK Day by cheering a movie about a white guy shooting brown people. Yeah, I'm looking at a different one then. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Because oh, at yeah. the porn oh stash, stash S T A S H, last tweet was one million girls uh, retweeting one million girls with some boobs. <laughs> yeah, no, no, so, yeah. This is the T H E, and then P O R N S T A C H E. Yeah, the the porn stash. Sorry, like you know, at symbol. Wait, spell that again. Oh, sorry. So it's basically the T H E, and then. P O R N S T A C H E. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. That no, stash. Was, yeah. And sometimes I sort of rage tweet at like the local uh 
sort of breakfast TV because they always have like psychics and, you know, herbologists and well, they have a lot of woo in the morning time. And I'm like, oh, come on, really? Are you doing this? And so I'll sort of rage tweet at them. And and then um, there was a Canadian producer who sort of did this documentary like he he I think he honestly thought he he found a uh, like a MIA, you know, P, MIA POW in Vietnam, like someone had been left behind in the uh, in the 1960s and the whole documentary about finding this guy and then, you know, bringing him back to North America to meet his long lost relatives. And and but, you know, but like everybody with any knowledge of this guy is like, no, this is just this guy is like sort of like a half French, half Vietnamese guy that that uh just has been pulling this hoax for decades like trying to get anybody to listen and you're just the latest idiot to fall for him and like he doesn't speak english but he speaks french and vietnamese and <laughs> and somehow this this guy made this movie and he, he was a respectable movie maker too and uh, and uh and it was sort of you know went to all these film festivals and got all this press and all these headlines about you know you know, MIA Vietnam vet found, you know, you know, and stuff like that and left behind and big conspiracy that the American military doesn't want, you know, you to know about it. And it's just like, no, no, they, they, they gave him a DNA test and fingerprints. And, and I could not convince any of the, the journal, like the major journalists in Toronto who are like, we found one, you know, I'm like, no, green berets have gone there because the, the guy was a former green beret and the green berets who knew him have gone there. And they're like, no, he's, oh, he's, he's just a half French, half Vietnamese guy. And, <laughs> and, you know, then the embassy has fingerprinted him and they've DNA typed him and, and Western journalists who have been in, in country for decades who do stories about MIA, they're calling him a hoax. And, you know, and, 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 and nothing I could do can, could convince local Toronto journalists that, you know, maybe the experts on the ground know something more than you do. And then eventually, like the family, the family was totally convinced that, you know, this producer has found our brother. And, uh, and, uh, in the film, there's this tearful reunion between the sister who's got maybe a year left of life and, and this Vietnamese hoax, you know, hoaxer claiming to be your brother. Yeah. And, and so the family is like, well, we got to get to the bottom of this. We're going to do a DNA test. And, and they, 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 they started up like one of those Kickstarter type things, go fund me to raise money. And they, they literally were going to, going to, uh, dig up his dead mother to get DNA from her and then, you know, test people in the family to see if this guy was him. And, uh, and then they, they, they fortunately did not make enough money to, dig up the dead mother and you know get you know dna from her and then they sort of use another dna test and were sort of able to test like who, who should be his nephew and they found out that oh no it, it's not him <laughs> you know wow <laughs> but but the family's still convinced okay he's not our guy but he's still an american obviously yeah so they're they're, they're the last time i checked that they were still Okay, well, he's not our American. He's still an American. And it's like, oh, you know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's unclaimed. Some un people just really want to believe. Yeah. Unclaimed is the name of the movie. Unclaimed. It was a documentary. Oh, goodness. That is Crazy. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I went, once they, he failed the DNA test, I did have some joy sort of emailing the journalist and going, told ya. <laughs> yeah. You're all right, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, man. Uh, we're starting to run low on time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no I got that birthday party to get to. Oh. Okay, yeah. yeah, my girlfriend will be back with her, with her daughter pretty soon, too. Anything you want to plug? Uh, well, I guess, you know, I mean, my podcast, if you've heard about it, The Conspiracy Skeptic, uh, you can find it on iTunes or my website, uh, yrad, W-R-A-Y-D dot com, uh, forward slash, forward slash CS for Conspiracy Skeptic, or just go to yrad dot com, but it's usually just easier to find it in iTunes, Conspiracy Skeptic. Um, I, I do a, a podcast also called Ask a Canadian. Um, that's where for Americans, most from the South with facial hair, they, uh, they ask me questions about Canada and then I sort of answer. It's a comedy show. It's the questions and the answers are all kind of supposed to meant to be funny. And, um, it's interesting in that the, the, the 
the Canadian iTunes ratings for Ask a Canadian are like one star. People hate it. <laughs> and where the American ratings are like four stars and they're like, this is the funniest thing ever. And uh, <laughs> it's quite surprising. The American audience loves it. And the Canadians are like, Canadians, we don't have folds of skin there like your claim. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just didn't make up anything that comes to mind, and and uh, but I, my favorite thing about asking me is just making up curling terminology. Just had oh, a no. whole whole cloth, you know. On the fourth trucker, I don't know. <laughs> do you curl? Oh, no. no, I I have curled, uh, but uh, I don't even understand the sport, so. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical if that broom stuff even does anything, but isn't it kind of like darts, but with stones on ice? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. I think that the idea is just that you, you got to get your, your, your rock also known as the kipper. No, I'm just making that up. I like making up curling terminology. I think it's called <laughs> the rock. And uh, yeah. And then, uh, you, you basically, yeah, you have to get your rock the closest to the center, like the bullseye. And, uh, and there's the, the guy who throws the, slides the rock. He's called the skip. And I did not make that term up. That's the actual guy's name. He's called the skip. <laughs> and then the broom guys who I don't even know what their term is. And I won't, won't make up a term because you get the joke by now. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And it's, it's, um, it curling is like, like polo in America, you know, curling is like the wealthy curl, the wealthy play polo. So, you know, so, I mean, that's an awfully small circle. I mean, how do you get Dwayne Johnson in that little target? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> the rock. <laughs> Sorry. Well, maybe a little fodder for the next show. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's called ask, ask a Canadian. That's pretty much my other, other podcast. And that one comes out a little bit more regularly. So that's usually like once a month. So. Okay. <laughs> cool. So you've got links to those in the, the show notes and uh, also to your Twitter. Great. Looking forward to hearing some more though. From you. I do suggest following the link in the show notes as opposed to spelling it wrong, especially if you're at work. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to be a little cagey. Even that name, the porn stash, I'm always like uh, a little because when I tweet at people, I think they just sort of kind of freak out when they see the porn stash and the <laughs> it's Mark it's Mark Spitz. In case you're not sure whose picture that is, that is not me. I do not have a, a luscious mustache like that or six gold Olympic medals hanging on my wonderful bare chest. No, that's not me. So <laughs> that is that is a crop of Mark Spitz. <laughs> he was an Olympian in the seventies. And you're right. Definitely amazing porn stash. <laughs> <laughs> All right, boss. It's been a lot of fun, Carl. Oh, All yeah. right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. No problem. Okay. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com. Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com. Or leave us a voicemail message at 541-203-0666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads. Well, and the the sun coming before the plants. That's the plants because came before the sun, yeah. No, he says the plants came. Or before the plants the coming before the suns. Sorry, my fire alarm's going off. Oh no! You need to check that. Okay, uh, Lauren's cooking. <laughs> okay, she's quieted it down. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, anyway, the, the this is the Dustin Memorial Show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the the sun. Uh,